Okay. Then this thing will be okay. Now it's so. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so thanks for coming. My, my name is uh, Ted Erler. So this is the uh, first of four lectures on the subject of closed string field theory. So, um, so closed string field theory is, based, is a quantum field theory uh, whose uh, um, Feynman graph expansion gives you string amplitudes. So, um, so the interest in this uh, formalism in recent years has been uh, has been motivated by uh, the apparent uh, fact that uh, closed string field theory, this formalism, is necessary to give a fully uh, um, consistent formulation of string perturbation theory. So, uh, so possible applications as, uh, as uh, emphasized in uh, especially recent work by Ashok Sen include uh, divergences in string perturbation theory. So, uh, such divergences uh, inc include, say, unphysical divergences. So these include uh, um, these include divergence, uh, f for example, divergences which uh, follow from using a uh, Euclidean world sheet. Uh, towards the boundary of moduli space. Um, there are also uh, divergences due to uh, spurious poles. In uh, beta gamma correlation functions. So these are unphysical divergences that can appear when computing string amplitudes. Um, we can also have physical divergences, physical infrared divergences, and these include uh, divergences which correspond to the fact that the physical state condition is quantum corrected. So this is goes by the name of mass renormalization. Or that the vacuum state in which you develop uh, perturbation theory Uh, is also uh, quantum corrected. So, um, so uh, in in the formalism of closed string field theory, we know how to either avoid or cancel these divergences in a consistent way. That's one kind of application. Another application are formal properties 
of, uh, of string, of perturbative string theory. For example, that the S matrix is uh, unitary, the string S matrix is unitary, that it has crossing symmetry. Or that uh, the uh, or that the uh, theory is independent under adiabatic uh, deformations of the background around which you quantize the string. So this is, a, this is a background independence. So another uh, application is that uh, closed string field theory in principle gives you new observables. So it tells you how to compute in situations where the conventional world sheet formalism breaks down. So, uh, so, uh, so for example, these include the effects of uh, mass renormalization, and vacuum shift. Or, uh, or understanding for uh, strings and Ramon Ramon backgrounds. Uh, using the RNS formalism. So, uh, so these are potential applications. So, uh, what is a little bit surprising is that uh, these improvements in our conventional understanding of string perturbation theory uh, don't follow from some kind of incremental improvement in the usual sum over world sheets approach. Uh, so. Um, so they really require a, uh, a fundamentally different way of thinking about string perturbation theory, okay? And this is uh, formalism of closed string field theory. So, um, so closed string field theory uh, gives you some of the uh, rigor and conceptual clarity of working with uh, perturbative quantum field theory. And uh, it also gives you an exact space-time action for string theory. And it's, uh, g the gauge invariance of this action is very nice. So you can, in some sense, it's the nicest possible gauge symmetry that you could have in a, uh, in a quantum field theory. So in that sense, closed string field theory is quite, uh, is quite beautiful. But, uh, but uh, it's also true that uh, closed string field theory is hard. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the physical content of the theory is, uh, okay, as it's currently understood, is buried underneath mountains of unphysical data, which uh, is practically uncomputable anyway. So the difficulty of the theory uh, really uh, is, a, is a major uh, obstacle, but, uh, but hopefully uh, in... Uh, in the coming years or at this workshop, uh, uh, we can understand better how to compute with this theory efficiently to extract the physical information that we want. So, okay, so any questions? Okay, it's just uh, some introductory motivation. Okay, so let's take a, uh, a look at closed string field theory. Okay, so.
just give a uh, give a summary of the structure. So closed string field theory is the field theory is the field theory of fluctuations of a closed string background. So uh, a closed string background is equivalent to a, a choice of uh, matter plus ghost uh, world sheet CFT with vanishing central charge. So, uh, so basically, specifying a closed string background is the same as specifying the world sheet theory of a closed string, which is moving in that background. So, uh, so a fluctuation of uh, of the background should be the same thing as the space as uh, deformations of uh, the corresponding CFT. So the deformations of the uh, of the world sheet CFT are given by uh, the vector space of local operators of, uh, of the CFT. And the reason why this is true is that if you're given, say, a world sheet action, some reference world sheet action for the closed string moving in some reference background, uh, you can deform this action to a uh, to a closed string moving in some other background by just adding a coupling to this uh, world sheet operator. Is that clear? So that so that means uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Why did I write W Z? Okay. <laughs> okay. So now, uh, yeah. So we will be talking about string field theory. Um, so it doesn't matter at the moment so much what version we're talking about. Okay. Because uh, open string field theory, uh, <laughs> just to limit the scope of what I discuss. Okay, so um, so most uh, work on string perturbation theory, based on closed string on string field theory in, re in recent years, is based on closed string field theory. So. Uh, in principle, there are generalizations of these ideas using open closed string field theory, but that's uh, an even more complicated structure than closed string field theory. So, um, okay, so, um, so now a, a deformation of this uh, world sheet action by this operator in general will not preserve conformal invariance, okay? So this deformation does not 
preserve conformal invariance. So, uh, okay, so, so, but this is okay. And the reason is that right now we are uh, interested in, cons is in considering uh, basically the space of possible fluctuations of, uh, of the background. And uh, the, uh, the space of actual fluctuations are those which satisfy the equations of motion. So a generic field configuration, a generic fluctuation field is not something physical. And that would correspond to a deformation of the world sheet action, which doesn't preserve conformal invariance. So uh, a priori, we have to consider all possible deformations and then uh, restrict to the physical ones by imposing equations of motion. So the vector space of local operators by the state operator map is uh, basically isomorphic, isomorphic to the space of states. Of the, uh, of the CFT. So we write this uh, space of states as uh, really H. So the claim, based on the claim, is that a closed string field is a, an element of uh, the vector space H of uh, states in the CFT. Okay. So, uh, is the motivation clear here? Okay, so, um, so we want the, we're interested in the fluctuations of a closed string background. We argued that those fluctuations are given by local operators of the CFT. We argued that local operators are the same as states, and therefore the fluctuation is given by a state in the CFT. Now, uh, okay, so this uh, vector space H has, uh, has some important gradings. It has a uh, Z grading which is often called ghost number which is the number of uh, B, uh, number of C ghosts minus the number of B ghosts and the number of beta ghosts minus the number of gamma ghosts. Uh, etc. And it also has a Z2 grading, which is just, which we will call Grassmann parity. Which basically tells us whether the state or its corresponding vertex operator is a commuting or an anti-commuting object. So there may be other gradings of this vector space, for example, picture number or uh, Ramond number or something like that. Uh, but these gradings play a more peripheral role in the structure of the theory. So uh, I will just mention these two gradings, which are kind of essential ingredient. And then, uh, okay, uh, now I make an additional claim, which is that the dynamical closed string field which we'll write phi so this is the closed string field which is the uh, dynamical variable of the theory it's the string field which appears in the action. So the dynamical closed string field 
uh, is an element of a uh, subspace of the full state space H, where uh, H hat is characterized by uh, some linear constraints. For example, the level matching condition. Okay, okay, also phi is Grassman even, so it's an even, even state. And uh, classically, it contains ghost number two. So this is the dynamical closed string field. Are there any questions about this? What? Uh, I don't think so, not to my knowledge. Uh, backgrounds where there's no split between left movers and right movers. So some kind of purely holomorphic CFTE or something? Okay, then I'm not sure how to formulate the theory. So maybe you're having in mind this, these ambitwister ideas? Or? Oh. Uh, okay, I don't know about that. Um, but, uh, okay, so, so, uh, okay, so it turns out to formulate the closed string field theory, you do need uh, some condition like the level matching constraint. Why it's a linear constraint? Well, in principle, well, these, these fluctuations can be large, okay? And the, uh, the field equation for the fluctuations is definitely nonlinear. But the constraint is linear, and uh, this is uh, somehow more of a matter of convenience. Or... So if you wrote down some field equations with some nonlinear constraint, so this happens often, for example, in West Amino witten like string field theories, you have a nonlinear constraint you basically try your best to linearize it or to solve the constraint using the string field. So, um, so this is just a claim that, uh, okay, so it's not, uh, I'm not uh, at this point claiming that you should understand why uh, the dynamical field should be uh, in this uh, linear, in a linear subspace of the full state space. In principle, it could uh, be, uh, be, uh, an arbitrary element of the state space, but I'm just claiming that uh, if you try to do this, it gives problems. Uh, I, I think it's a subspace characterized by a linear constraint. There's no equivalence relation. Um, okay, it probably maybe could be characterized in that way, but uh, um, it's just a linear constraint uh, on the on this, that defines the subspace. Um, so, um, okay, so, uh, so the, the motivation for the, uh, for, uh, the uh, ghost number and Grassman assignments comes from the fact that a on-shell vertex operator For example, in uh, bosonic string theory, uh, 
um, takes uh, takes the form C C bar E matter zero zero where uh, where this uh, this operator is a is a one comma one primary okay in uh, the uh, So this is the form of an on-shell conformal vertex operator in uh, closed string in uh, closed string theory, a closed string vertex operator, <coughs> and uh, you could see that uh, this operator contains c times c bar, so it has ghost number two, and because they come in a pair, it's an even vertex operator. So this uh, this condition is. Uh, is uh, now de also demanded on an arbitrary fluctuation. Okay, so with this uh, motivation, so now we can write down the action for this uh, fluctuation field, okay? And the action takes this form, okay? So that's this long equation that I wrote here. So let me uh, describe the ingredients So, um, so the first ingredient is a symplectic form. So, uh, so this is written. You can write this as uh, a double bra state, which is a bilinear map from two copies of this state space into uh, uh, zero copies. <laughs> you could say this is just complex numbers. Okay, it's a symplectic form. And uh, because the form is symplectic, there is a, there's also an inverse. There's a Poisson by vector, which is a element of uh, two copies of the state space. Okay, and this Poisson by vector it inverts this symplectic form, uh, and we can write that uh, in this in this way. Where one is the identity operator on our uh, on the vector space, and uh, basically, uh, I don't know if this notation is clear, but uh, so basically, here we have three states uh, in here. Two of them are taken by this uh, by this object. One is by the identity operator, and uh, here one is taken by this, and another two by this. And then when you contract them. Uh, in some sense, uh, uh, you just end up with the identity operator. Okay, <laughs> is this clear? This notation. Yeah. So, uh, uh, okay. How, how should I? Right. It uh, okay. We, we, so this, so I will be using this notation a lot, and I'm not quite sure how clear it is to people. So uh, let me try to uh, uh, I don't know write it in a different way. So uh, so we can write say omega is a very long, a very tall thing that has say two inputs. Okay, and uh, omega inverse is a very long. Thing that has two outputs, okay, and uh, this thing is okay. 
So here we have the identity operator, and here we have the identity operator, okay? And basically what you do is you act in here. Uh, the identity is uh, now, uh, is now uh, uh, okay. First you pass through this identity operator, which is there, then you reach this guy, and then you go through here, okay, there, and then, uh, then the output, you have this identity operator here, uh, and then you get out this way. Is this clear? Well, it's not a dual Hilbert space, but you can introduce labels to write this out explicitly. I was hoping I wouldn't have to do that, but uh, um, let's. Uh, uh, okay, so let's uh, let's try to write this out. So, uh, okay, so, so when you act here, okay, it, uh, uh, okay, okay. Uh, I'm try, trying to think how, how to explain this, uh, this better. Yes, and there's an internal leg which connects this one to this one. And, uh, okay, so basically we, in uh, okay, in here we have three state spaces, and uh, okay, and uh, yeah, and uh, one space is the input, and the other space uh, is the output. Okay, so uh, okay. Okay, so there's this symplectic form, and then. Uh, Okay, then there are there is the uh, BRST operator. Which is a map from the vector space into itself. BRST operator has ghost number one and is Grassmann odd, and it squares to zero. So this is given to us as part of the BRST operator is automatically given to us as part of the data of our world sheet CFT. And then finally, the non-trivial ingredient, ingredient are the multi-string products. Okay. So these are multilinear maps from n copies of our vector space into one copy. Okay, so they're basically, uh, okay, a higher rank generalization of a product of two things. So instead it's a product of n things. And then there is a, an additional label here, G, and this is, uh, this is, the genus of the product. Okay, so, um, so let me draw a picture just to give you an idea of what's going on. So, um, so the genus, uh, okay, so roughly speaking, we can visualize uh, the, these, uh, these uh, multi-string products correspond to a path integral over a genus G Riemann surface with uh, n plus one punctures or n plus one states, okay? So we have uh, 
N holes, or sorry, G holes for the genus. And we have uh, N uh, input states and one output state. Okay, so in total we have N plus one punctures. So this product corresponds to a path integral over a surface like this, where N of the punctures, okay, represent the uh, states which are being multiplied, and the last puncture is somehow the result of the product, okay? So this is, uh, 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 this is these are roughly what, uh, what these products are. Okay, so. Um. Yes. So genus genus zero is this first line. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm writing down the full result, the full result for the quantum uh, closed string field theory. Okay, which includes loop vertices. So I will comment on that more in a moment. Some non-perturbative vertex. Yeah. But now we're interested in string perturbation theory. <laughs> okay. Or maybe there are no non-perturbative effects, or maybe they're somehow implied by this uh, re Borel resummation of the action or something. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so so these are these uh, multi-string products, okay, and they, they satisfy algebraic relations okay, that generalize the statement that uh, q squared equals zero. So the nature of these relations, okay, I can summarize them for you. So it turns out that there is a natural way, um, so we can generalize uh, these products in a essentially algebraic and natural way, to be uh, linear operators on the symmetrized tensor algebra of, uh, of your uh, state space, okay? So, uh, okay, so a priori, they're only acting on n copies of our state space and giving us one copy, but there's a algebraic procedure that allows you to generalize this definition so that uh, the products act on the symmetrized tensor algebra of states. And in this case, uh, when the products are generalized in this way, Yeah, so you could take uh, zero copies of H, one copy, and then two pro two copies. Uh, you have to uh, you have to. Yes, but here we've we've actually claimed that there's a natural way to define it so that it acts on uh, M M uh, symmetrized states with m greater than n, okay? Okay, so, so now, uh, so this is kind of some uh, abstraction, so... 
What? The full sum of all symmetrized tensor, pro it's the tensor algebra. Yes? What? Identical. So, so that, that will be the genus zero, one string product is the same as Q. Okay. Why? This is just a matter of notation. So you just uh, follow this, uh, follow the pattern here, and uh, you see that uh, this thing is something we could have named L01. Okay, but okay. So if you uh, if you uh, lift these uh, these products into operators on this symmetrized tensor algebra, you can add them. Okay. So you can sum over the uh, you can sum over n and g. Okay. And then you can add the uh, the Poisson bivector. And it turns out that this object squares to zero. So this is a nonlinear generalization of the statement of BRST invariance. This is called a quantum L infinity algebra. So uh, there's also a, uh, a classical L infinity algebra, which is a little bit more familiar to some people. So the classical L infinity algebra is given by just summing the genus zero products. Okay, and in that case, you don't need uh, this inverse Poisson bivector. So if you just take Well, it acts on zero copies of uh, H. You could think of it as an operator on zero copies of H, which gives you two copies of H. So I, I, I'm, I don't want to give the uh, full definitions now because uh, I'm, just, uh, I'm just hoping that it's uh, plausible to you that given these structures, one can uh, abstract a little bit and uh, write down such things, and then the statement of these algebraic relations is basically a nonlinear statement of BRST invariance. So, uh, so we can similarly uh, add uh, all the genus zero products, okay? And in this case, we don't need the Poisson bivector because we're not forming loops. And it turns out that this classical L squares to zero. So this is called uh, a uh, classical uh, L infinity algebra. Okay. Okay. So in some sense, this, uh, this Poisson bivector is uh, proportional to h bar. And if we set h bar equals to zero, uh, we can neglect it. And, uh, and as a result, we can also neglect the higher genus products. So, uh, okay, and okay, finally there's, okay, in addition to uh, this nonlinear BRST invariance, we also have a a condition of uh, cyclicity, okay, on the products, which is basically some compatibility of uh, uh, with the symplectic structure, okay. 
So this is, uh, okay, this is just a sketch of the algebraic structure. And uh, are there any questions at this point? Yeah, so uh, these products will only be defined on H hat. So on, only on level match states. Um, okay. Okay, so now make some comments. So now, okay, I hope that I've described to you everything that appears in that long formula, which is the action. Is, it, is everything clear? Okay. Um, okay, so... Now we make some comments. Okay, so comment number one. So this action takes the same form, the same general form for all string theories. and uh, backgrounds within those string theories. So the differences between uh, different string theories and uh, different backgrounds within those string theories is basically your choice of vector space. And some, uh, in some uh, technical details, on how the symplectic form and these products are explicitly defined, explicitly realized. But the algebraic structure, the basic structure of the theory that I've described is basically universal. Okay. Second comment, even if okay, we fix the uh, the string theory and the background the action is not unique And this is basically, uh, and this is basically uh, results from our freedom to make uh, field redefinitions. So, uh, so we can define a new closed string field, which is some, uh, which is some function, say expressed as a power series, of the original string field phi, and under some minor conditions on this choice of f that it's uh, say compatible with uh, cyclicity or with compatible with the symplectic structure, if you plug this into the action, you will get another action of the same form. So the action is not unique. Um, so the question, okay, it's a very interesting question. Uh, is there a uh, best possible choice of field variable?
Okay, so this question is where some of the most interesting mathematics of uh, the subject comes in. So uh, it's, a it's a intimately connected with uh, Riemann surface theory. So, um, so there are various proposals for, for defining this action in the best possible form, including uh, minimal area metrics and uh, in terms of hyperbolic geometry is a more recent proposal or, okay, there are also methods for, uh, for inserting picture changing operators and maybe one can get inside into that uh, using a supermoduli space techniques. But uh, this is a very uh, mathematically rich question. But I would say that no choice of, uh, of uh, the field variable is known, which really uh, makes this theory uh, accessible to comp computation in a practical sense, at least as far as I know right now. But maybe this will change. Uh, so, uh, but recent uh, studies of closed string field theory have not really needed to commit to a particular choice of what these uh, products really are. So one can uh, just make general arguments and, uh, and one. Yes. Yes. Yes, so in principle one can uh, have an inhomogeneous term in your field redefinition, and then uh, that corresponds to a shift of your closed string background. Okay, so that's expanding the theory around a solution of uh, the field equations. And then uh, that's in principle allowed as well, but then that modifies the, uh, the form of the BRST operator, so it's not just Q. Um. So, uh, we, so this is a very interesting question, but uh, we're not going to really uh, get into it that much in these, in these lectures. So, okay, a third comment is that, uh, is that closed string field theory is analogous to perturbative quantum gravity. By perturbative quantum gravity, I mean that you choose some uh, classical solution of, the, uh, of Einstein's equations, and then you add some fluctuation, some small fluctuation of this classical solution, and then you expand the Einstein-Hilbert action uh, out. And if you do that, okay, you, you probably know that, if, that the uh, Einstein-Hilbert action is non-polynomial, so you will get an infinite number of terms, okay? So those infinite number of terms correspond to these uh, classical products that I've written in the first line. So the closed string field theory is polynomial in the same way as classical perturbative general relativity. And in addition, okay, perturbative quantum gravity, you have, uh, um, of course, problems with ultraviolet divergences which require that you add counter terms, okay? So these counter terms are in fact analogous to these loop correction, corrected products that I've written here. So these loop corrected products can be interpreted as the string theory analog of, uh, of the uh, counter terms that you need, the infinite number of counter terms you need to define quantum gravity perturbatively. So, um, here we don't have UV divergence, so that's what I was want to say. So, in fact, these terms are essentially fixed up to field redefinition by just requiring that the action is, uh, realizes this quantum L infinity structure. So, once you have 
basically the kinetic term of the action and the uh, interaction, if you impose uh, uh, L quantum squared equals zero, okay, you impose nonlinear BRST invariance, then all of your infinite number of counter terms are fixed uniquely, uh, at least up to the equivalence of field redefinition. So in that sense, uh, in this formalism, we can see that string theory uh, resolves the problems of perturbative quantum gravity, but uh, okay, at the same sense, uh, the f resulting formalism still looks rather perturbative, though in principle it's well defined. Um, okay, and okay, another, another thing that I wanted to mention, uh, the reason why I wrote this action in this particular form is that, uh, okay, so th this, uh, this expression, uh, the way I've arranged it, roughly uh, uh, corresponds to the uh, complication of the, uh, of the product uh, in, in, okay, <laughs> so, uh, okay, so, in the following sense, so um, so if you want to compute a uh, uh, okay, so the uh, genus G endpoint amplitude. Okay, is uh, the lowest order amplitude okay, where you need uh, L, G, N minus one. So this product LG n minus one is the, f okay, the first time this product appears in the computation of an amplitude is the genus G endpoint amplitude. And in order to compute this amplitude, in addition, you require uh, lower order products uh, and you require all, all lower order products which appear above and to the left, okay? So for example, if we want to compute, uh, say the, uh, the one loop two point function, we require L11, L03, L02, L10, and okay, of course, Q, okay. So, so you can, uh, okay, so you, you can uh, write down all the terms. So, so one loop uh, two point function Or two point amplitude. Okay, so there's a contribution from uh, from the one loop two point vertex, and this is uh, L11, which is written here. There's also a contribution from the genus zero uh, four point vertex. It's L03, where you have a propagator uh, connecting two of the legs. So that's another diagram that appears. That's this one. You also have, uh, am I, like, make sure I get them all. Okay, also have diagram like this. Okay, so this involves L10, uh, the tadpole vertex, and uh, also L03. And then, okay, and then there are these diagrams. And 
These biograms have two propagators. Okay. So, uh, so that's why I've chosen to write these things out th in this way. So you could see that, say, the uh, two-loop tadpole amplitude will require that you know that you have explicit information about quite a few products if you want to compute it. Okay. So maybe it's a nice exercise. Okay. Give Feynman graphs. for, uh, say, uh, okay, the two-loop tadpole. Okay, so that's uh, just to give you some practice. Oh, uh, uh, yes, yes, sorry, this is L0. No, this is L03. This is this one. And this one is actually, this one is a mistake. This one's L02. Okay, so it's a little bit confusing because a product, an endpoint product defines an N plus one point vertex. Okay, okay. Yes? Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, because uh, you, from the, the old-fashioned point of view, you take something which is genus minus one with uh, two legs more, and then you glue them together. Uh huh. And this is. Uh, Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, everything else looks right. So there's no one over zero factorial in this action, which is kind of interesting. But... Uh, <laughs> That's for the uh, cosmological constant, but apparently it's not, uh, it's not fixed by just uh, perturbative scattering amplitudes. So, okay. So this kind of uh, completes the introduction. And now would be a nice time to take a break, but uh, I'm afraid that uh, we probably don't have enough time for that right now. Um, so are there any other questions? Uh, if we could just kind of take a, a uh, short. Okay, so now we're go actually going to try to uh, construct this theory. So this was, all I've done so far is really just kind of summarize the basic structure. Uh, so now we are going to talk about off-shell amplitudes. Okay. So, um, uh, okay, so what is an, an off-shell amplitude? So an off-shell amplitude is some, okay, at the very least, it's some kind of continuation of the on-shell amplitude 
to uh, momenta which are not constrained to sat, to sit on the mass shell, right? Yes? Momenta are not defined in the curve in space. Well, okay. Okay. Well, I, okay, I don't want to get into the question of what are the observables in quantum gravity and an arbitrary space time. Well, okay, offshore, uh, okay. You could talk about all sorts of things that have no meaning, right? So offshell amplitudes have meaning, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> So the things that it's meaningful are, are uh, on-shell quantities or observable gauge invariant quantities. But nevertheless, uh, okay, we're going to, for now, we're going to talk about off-shell amplitudes, okay? So an off-shell amplitude is some kind of continuation of an amplitude to uh, generic off-shell momenta, okay? But, uh, at the, okay, what, what we have in mind, uh, okay, more specifically is a map A G N, let's say this is the off shell endpoint amplitude, okay, which takes H hat tensor N into numbers, which we could just write as H hat tensor zero. So it's a multilinear map from states into numbers, which satisfies the following conditions. Okay. So condition one is, uh, what is condition one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Condition one is that uh, off-shell amplitude are defined on... Uh, H hat, where H hat is some vector space which satisfies, uh, okay, these uh, inclusions. Where H is the full CFT vector space, and HQR is the vector space of BRST invariant conformal vertex operators. So, uh, okay, I should, I should have mentioned this uh, at the beginning. So we're just going to, we're going to concentrate on, on off-shell amplitudes in bosonic string theory for now. So at, towards the end of this lecture, we can talk a little bit about how this is generalized for the superstring. So uh, an off-shell amplitude should be defined on this vector space, uh, which is larger than the vector space of BRST invariant conformal vertex operators. And we want this vector space to be as large as conveniently possible, okay? So uh, in principle, we would like this space H hat to be the same as H, okay? But as you may anticipate, we will find that H hat actually has to satisfy the level matching constraint. So uh, we won't be able to get to the full state space, but we will be able to get uh, fairly close. So that's uh, so we want this state space H hat to be as big as possible. Okay. Yes, we will see that that is that is natural. But now, okay, now we're just trying to give a, as a, uh, a maximal definition of an off-shell amplitude with the biggest set of states that we can imagine, okay? And this biggest set of states in turn will actually end up being the space of, uh, in which the physical uh, closed string field lives. So uh, second condition is uh, that, okay, if 
if the amplitude acts on HQ, which is a subset of H hat, then, uh, then it is the same as uh, the physical on shell endpoint amplitude at uh, genus G. Okay. Okay. Okay, one the latter is finite. <laughs> HQ are not necessarily massless vertex operators. Uh, yeah, so if there's mass renormalization. Or... I'm not sure what kind of infrared divergence. No, no, it's not infrared. It's, uh, it's not infrared. It's simply random. It's infinite because uh, you, have a, you can go on shell in, uh, in the propagator when you are massive. And you are not protected well, by the edges. Well, okay, uh, okay. So for generic momenta, you don't, you don't expect to be on a, on a resonance, right? Okay, let's, let's talk about Lee. Okay. Well, uh, the reason is because this is, these are the vertex operators that are used in uh, normal perturbative string theory. And so people know what they are. And they give the right amplitudes uh, when 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 it's well defined. Okay, so uh, so basically it's condition two, just saying that the off shell amplitude should reproduce the result that you know when you comp when you can compute it. Okay, and when you can't compute it, then it sh okay it should give you some okay other result. Okay, but, which is finite. <laughs> okay. Okay. Can, and then the, the third condition is that uh, the, the off shell amplitude is uh, BRST invariant. Okay. So. Okay, if you ignore contributions from the boundary of moduli space. So, uh, Okay, so this is basically uh, the off-shell statement that uh, BRST trivial states should decouple, okay? So, okay, here I'm using a notation where uh, Q, now uh, this thing is a map from n copies of H, okay, so, so Q really means Q tensor one, tensor n minus one plus 
So you, it means you act Q on all of the uh, all of the inputs. Okay. Okay. So that's that's uh, just a piece of notation. And okay. So these are the conditions that we will use to define an off-shell amplitude. So okay, as I was. Uh, mentioning before, so an off-shell amplitude is not a physical quantity, so it's not really something that is of direct interest a priori, okay, especially without some additional structure that you might get from a Feynman graph expansion in, in string field theory. But uh, we are, okay, we are interested in this concept because an off-shell amplitude is very close to being the same thing as a vertex in the string field theory action. So basically, the vertex, or these products in this action, are off-shell amplitudes where you, uh, where you basically uh, leave out the portion of integration from the boundary of moduli space. So, uh, so rather than, so basically the uh, off-shell amplitudes are kind of a warm-up exercise for getting at what these uh, multi-string products are. So, um, okay, is that clear? That's our motivation. Okay, so um, maybe I, I think I want to stop now because I'm getting a little tired and, uh, okay, it's 10 minutes early, but uh, I'm not sure I have a good stopping point that in 10 minutes, so maybe you can have some questions now. Is, is there any? Uh, well, um, okay, so you could say that this is just a definition of what, <laughs> okay, so uh, if there are boundary contributions, either they matter or they don't matter, okay? If they don't matter, so if they're, because you're u using a Euclidean propagator or something and there's some negative weight field propagating over a long distance, then you can kind of get rid of these boundary contributions by, uh, by analytically continuing to some, uh, momentum region where uh, where they vanish and then you can argue by continuing back that they should have vanished from the beginning okay uh, or uh, you can have a truly physical infrared divergence and then you have to deal with it basically using Feynman graphs and closed string field theory but we're not there yet so uh, so we will just uh, pretend that these boundary contributions are not there okay Uh, well, I would say that if you don't have BRST invariant conformal vertex operators, uh, there isn't a uh, established prescription for computing the amplitude in the old-fashioned way. So there are kind of generalizations, which basically is what I'm going to be describing here which allow you to get at certain other states, uh, which may not be of that form. So, okay, so in particular, this off-shell amplitude will be defined on asymptotic states, which are not conformally invariant, but are still in the BRST cohomology, okay? In addition to other states, which are just not BRST invariant. So this, so this off-shell amplitude will allow you to leave Siegel gauge, so to speak. That has uh, well, okay. The problem is basically what we're going to discuss next time, which is that uh, you need to specify a conformal frame for uh, inserting the operator at the puncture. So 
a problem for what you're going to construct. Well, they're represent, okay, the claim is that, <laughs> okay, this is the off-shell amplitude, and it will allow you to compute scattering of states which are not, say, in this, which are not conformal vertex operators. So the question of what uh, you should do in the standard world sheet prescription if you don't have a conformal vertex operator, I think you, you just don't know what to do without, uh, without uh, doing something like what I'm going to describe uh, next time.